Blessed afternoon, church. The fourth word. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let us pray. Gracious God, as we step into your preaching moment once again, we ask that you would calm our hearts as we relive the horror of Good Friday. We ask that you would allow us to see the resurrection on the dawn and allow us to hear what you would have revealed to us on this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Folks, there is no novel sad enough. There is no myth fantastic enough. There is no memory vivid enough. There is no script that's been written perfect enough that can contain a line, a quote, a cry, a sentence, or phrase, or declaration, or exclamation as desolate or despairing as the one which I have the great misfortune of wrestling with today. The scene has already been made clear. There's a brother hanging from the cross, hanging from all intents and purposes the popular tree of death. He's been beaten, he's been bloodied, bruised, and battered. The blood is streaking down his head, moving down his body into the open wounds. It streaks down to his legs, which are weak, the same legs that brought him from Bethlehem to Nazareth, to Cana to Bethany, to Jericho to Jerusalem, and at one time it even brought him across the water. He's trying to lift himself up to breathe and finding it difficult. He's trying to lift himself up to look out over the people. The same breath that he's trying to breathe, he once proclaimed, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forward. The same breath he's trying to breathe once said, Father, who art in heaven. The same breath he's trying to breathe once said, take up your mat and walk. The same breath he's trying to breathe once said, open your eyes and see. The same breath he's trying to breathe said, your faith has made you well. And that's the same breath that has been trying to say, go your way and sin no more. Unfortunately, church, we've come to the point where Jesus has just told the people in front of the people, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But we stand in the moment now where he cannot even call his father, Father. He's had to change the relationship. He's now addressing him as a lowly person like you and me, as my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? The unceasing pain, the unceasing torment on his body. Nearly all of us here have the privilege of never ever needing to experience this physical torment. In spite of all of this, it, this truly wasn't what makes him cry out. Most of us here have lived long enough to understand the saying, the scars you see you can't see are the ones that are hardest to heal. So despite the nails being in his hands and feet, that's not what's truly bothering him. What's bothering Jesus is that every time he lifts himself up to look out over the masses, he doesn't see the same people that were just following him into Jerusalem. He's not even seeing his friends and associates that would, you would want to think would be there to comfort him. When he needs it the most, even his mother cannot truly comfort him. Only the people who are his enemies are there. He's suffering from emotional, spiritual, psychological torment. And it is in this context 
that Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which can be translated for those of us who have a bit more direct verbiage, my God, my God, where the hell are you? I hope presenting the misery of Jesus this way in this realistic fashion can help some of us sit and admit that there are a few times in our lives where we've had to make such a cry. Where sometimes we've even had to use colorful language to get across our point to God. We too often treat Christianity like it's an insurance company. And when we get in trouble, we want God to step in for us. And then when we realize it's not going the way we want, we cry out, well, God, I went to church. I paid my tithe. I prayed. I fasted. I gave money to the homeless man on White Plains Road. Why didn't you come when I wanted you to? So we feel abandonment by God. I've reflected on this message many times, and I realize that I've heard this sermon preached in simply two contexts. I've heard this text preached many times over the years in the first way being that the notion that the question mark at the end of the question isn't really there. It's trying to get across to us that Jesus really wasn't questioning God, but it was in his misery he was trying to teach us something. That even though he was messed up in the mind and body, he was still able to reference Psalm 22 and teach the people something before he left the earth. Undoubtedly, that these Easter messages find great truths and are great messages to be preached, and there's nothing wrong with that. Other, the other type of sermon that I've heard is, well, yes, acknowledging that Jesus is questioning God, but it's because this was the fully human Jesus speaking and not the divine. Jesus, the human, is feeling abandoned. So yes, he has to question, well, God, where are you? Today, I hope that it becomes apparent those are not the veins in which we reflect on this message. Because unfortunately, I cannot stand before you and act as if I was there at the cross that day. I wasn't standing there taking notes at each passing moment. Today we have to go a different route that I can only believe this is what the scripture is revealing for us in 2023. And in order to do that, I must ask all of you for a moment to realize that the scripture puts us in the presence of darkness. Jesus is dying. Jesus, the light of the world, is dying. Darkness only exists because there is no light present. The reality is that there is no darkness, just the absence of light. Our job is to stay in the light, to stay in the know, to keep our eyes open. The light of the body is the eye. We must keep seeing what's in front of us. The reality is that there is no darkness, just the absence of light. So if you're not in the light, if you're not commanding light, you're not in sight, and then what is in the dark will harm you. Truth be told, darkness only exists because there is a light somewhere not shining. There's sight somewhere not seeing. There are many in this world who feel forsaken, and we should pace ourselves in the character position of God in this scripture. Sometimes the only representative the world will meet of God is you and me. So those in the world who are suffering, those in the world who are dejected, who daily say to God, why have you forsaken me, truly aren't talking to God, but are talking to you and to me. Talking to us who call ourselves Christians. We cannot name all of them, but a few come to mind in recent modern day history. Half the population of this country has asked the same question, why have we forsaken them? Women have been forsaken in this place. They cannot make the church feel safe or like a safe haven from the hell of the world. 
Women have wondered why they can't escape sexism and chauvinism in the world. When they come to the church, they wonder why they make up huge numbers of congregation but disproportionate amounts of leadership. Women have come to wonder why they can't come to the safe place, the church, to run from abusive spouses or family members. Even our young women cannot come into the church and feel safe because we have portrayed them to not meet the qualifications of the church family. Young women who find themselves pushed out of the church into the arms of the irresponsible public and then when they return to the church, we find them that every month the belly grows bigger, the church family grows more distant. Young women who are now looked at as if they're not carrying another human life but are carrying the very sin and shame. We wonder why instead of the elders of the church praying over them, they pray on them. We have come to forsake our children. Look at the students across the country. I found on social media being circulated a list of schools, elementary, middle, high school, college, and university alike. 493 schools that have been affected by acts of violence, gun violence in particular. We have forsaken our children. We have forsaken others as well, the very people who sit in our pews, who have their own stories of feeling forsaken. Some of us who are suffering financially, medically, psychologically, legally, educationally, wondering why our churches are filled with doctors and lawyers and teachers and therapists and stockbrokers and tax specialists, but the only thing they offer are thoughts and prayers. We wonder why can we be in this situation where they only try to give us a hi and a hello and not help. Those people might even very well say, well, I've got my own stuff I'm dealing with, my own issues, my own financial stresses. It shouldn't be me offering help to these people who are suffering. But for some reason, for some strange reason, when I was flipping through the scriptures, I don't come, recall coming across Jesus saying his shoulders were too heavy. I don't recall Jesus ever saying, I cannot bear your burden. I don't remember reading in the scripture Jesus saying, my legs are too tired, I cannot walk with you. I don't remember reading in the scriptures Jesus saying, it's too hard to breathe, I cannot tell you that everything is going to be all right. So there are those Christians, those of us who look toward our peers to say just a simple uplifting statement to sit with us and pray who are looking for a little help in the time of trouble. Because I do remember reading somewhere that whatever you do for the least of these, you did also to me. So we must realize, church, that we did not sign up for an insurance company. We signed up for a job. Signing up for a job means that you have a duty and it means you have a responsibility. But too many of us became Christians just to take care of our own situation. We want our own lives to shape up and shape out. We want to be made to look perfect, but not actually strive for that perfection. Truth be told, I'm still trying to find that perfect person who claims to be Christian, but that's all we can do is strive to go on to that perfect calling of the Heavenly Father. So today I find it fitting that the word, the fourth word on this subject, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me, fell to me because it forces us to stop talking about it and walk through it. It forces us to realize that we cannot forsake Jesus today. We cannot be guilty of forsaking the one that we call Christ by forsaking our brother and sister. So let your light shine, church. Dispel the darkness that has come over the land. For we need to be God's representative in the land today and not be being seen on TV with the banner with our great evangelical title or church title and speaking opposite 
of what that means. But we need to be seen in the world, living it out and acting it in its truth. Because today, Jesus isn't just proclaiming feeling forsaken because God has left him. It's because we have left him. So when you hear the echoes of your neighbor, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Don't think that it's God somewhere far off in the cosmos. It is you and I in flesh and blood who are the reflection of God in the earth. Because the truth is Jesus died for us to take his place. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 God is good.